finish his lecture within one hour or three hours. So uh, I'm very pleased today to present our distinguished visiting professor at the School of uh, Graduate Education, uh, Dr. Michael uh, Gianmecco, uh, who is a professor at the Department uh, of Education, a special education program at the University of Vermont, and who is also affiliated with the University Center on Disability and Community Inclusion. Prior to joining, to joining the faculty at the uh, University of Vermont in 1988, he served in a variety of capacities, uh, such as community, community residence counselor with adults with developmental disabilities, special education teacher, special education administrator. His work focuses on various aspects of education for students with, uh, for students with developmental disabilities, within general uh, education classrooms, such as curriculum planning and adaptation, related uh, services, decision-making, and coordination, alternatives to over-reliance on uh, paraprofessionals and inclusive special education uh, service delivery. Uh, Dr. Jeff Reclo has directed several federal grants and a series uh, of other externally funded projects. He has also numerous professional publications on a variety of special education topics. He currently serves as the coordinator of graduate programs in specialists in special education at the University of Vermont and chairs the University of Vermont Professional Standards Committee. So uh, this afternoon, uh, he will be going to talk to us about lessons learned about inclusive education in the United States, potential implications for Egypt. And so please uh, join me in welcoming. Um, uh, Professor Giancarico, and uh, we're all very sort of interested to hear what you what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, yes, that'd be great. I'm going to make the screen because it's more important for you to look at the screen than to look at me or to look at me. Uh, so, for some of you, there's at least a few of you that were at the presentation that I gave that I gave the other day. And I thought we were going to have completely different audiences. So you will see a few slides, not many, but you will see a few slides that you saw the other day. So uh, please excuse that if you were here the other day. I want to also, before I start, just say that I've been here now for five days in Egypt. And uh, it has been a very uh, welcoming place to be in terms of the people that I've met. And if, and if the welcome that I've received is any um, indication of your capacity to carry out inclusive education, uh, you're on a good path because it seems that the culture is uh, very welcoming to people. So, as I said the other day, it's uh, I don't know this much about Egyptian education. So I'm going to present what is happening in Vermont and to some extent in the United States in general because they're different. And I'm counting on you to see how it might apply in the Egyptian context. I come from Vermont, which is on the Canadian border, a uh, very cold place. That's my yard uh, where I live. I left a lot of snow behind, and I understand they had a snowstorm just yesterday. So I want to start by um, talking about some very general things. So who's disabled? Who needs special education? One of the things that uh, we know is that disability is socially constructed. It's defined differently in different countries. And so when you look at what percentage of students have disabilities in one country versus another, the numbers vary dramatically. Some countries have a uh, percentage as low as about 2% and others over 20%. Those countries typically don't have different actual percentages, it's just they define disability differently. And one of the key uh, differences is whether or not they identify what Americans would call specific learning disabilities as a disability. And it's important that I say what that Americans call specific learning disabilities because the term, even the term learning disabilities, you have to put in the context of a country because if you were to say learning disabilities in the UK, that means intellectual disability in the US. So, uh, and US and Italy are uh, great examples because this is based on, I spent three months uh, studying in Italy in 2011. They uh, only identify about three to four percent of their students. Uh, it's gone up, it used to be two to 
three percent now it's three to four percent it's inching up a little bit but they have let's say roughly three to four percent we have 13 percent in the united states 16 percent in vermont who are identified as having a disability the difference is that in italy all the students with uh, learning disabilities are not considered disabled they are not covered under their special education law they're covered under their regular education law it's acknowledged that they have learning differences. It's acknowledged that the teachers need to make accommodations for them, but they are not considered persons with disabilities. So I've been talking to people all week about hoping that as you move in on your path toward inclusive education that you can avoid some of the mistakes that we've made. Because one of the things that is so interesting, it happens all over the world and it happens within the United States People go on these incremental paths to change, and they repeat the exact same mistakes that others before them made. And in some ways, you have a great opportunity to leapfrog over the mistakes of others and not repeat what we've done. So it's the old Einstein quote about the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. And that's what we've kind of been doing all around the country. One of the things that, uh, I think it's been a bedrock of one of the things that this is an example of something you can do to avoid the mistakes of others and that is avoiding pathologizing difference is disability just because somebody's different doesn't mean they're disabled um, for example in the u.s the definition of autism spectrum disorder has changed dramatically it used to be that autism was this wide now autism is this wide um, and that we also don't need to require a label or a designation of disability for somebody to receive service. So this has been one of the problems in our country is we have children who say, well, these children need help. Well, how do we get them help? Well, we give them a label, we categorize them, we test them, we categorize them, we put them in special programs, special places uh, in order to get service. And again, we, we make these things up. We don't have to do that. We can say if a child needs help, we help them. Um, and some schools are trying to do that. And one of the problems is that when we create all these unnecessary systems to label, categorize, sort, and separate students with the intention of helping them, we often inadvertently create more problems than we're solving. And you see some of them here. Stigma, lower expectations, less access to positive peer models, less access to general ed curriculum, less access to highly qualified personnel teachers. We want to avoid hierarchical uh, shifts in inclusion. So one of the things that people say is, well, we're going to start with kids that are neurotypical. Let's make sure we've got education for them set first. Then we'll move the kids with mild disabilities. Then we'll move the kids with more moderate disabilities. Then we'll move the kids with more severe disabilities. The problem with these hierarchical approaches is we never get to the students at the lower levels of the hierarchy. So again, this is an example of something where um, a country that's kind of where you are now, at least where I understand you are now, could leapfrog some of this, is to say, if we're going to start a new school or we're going to start a new program, whether it's public or private, uh, to think about all the kids that live in the community right from the beginning. Not, well, let's start with this group and then we'll work our way to the other groups. And because, uh, <clears throat> as it says here, one of the problems with drawing some kind of arbitrary line is that somebody's always going to be on the wrong side of that line. So, for example, our education law has a zero reject policy. So, it doesn't matter how severely disabled a student is, they're uh, eligible or entitled. Not eligible, they're entitled to public education. And I think that the other thing that is important, it's bottom point, is that if you know how to, if, you, if you're including students who have fairly mild disability, like a specific learning disability, which is not to um, say that those aren't potentially challenging for students, but compared to somebody who has severe multiple disabilities, it's, it's considered more mild disability. If you can figure out how to include students with mild disabilities, it doesn't necessarily help you very much, including students that have the most significant or, or 
more challenging situations and conditions. But if you can figure out how to work with the most intensive situations, that can generalize up much easier. So there's much to be learned by tackling the most challenging situations first. And again, otherwise we never get to these more challenging ones. We want to avoid change that's too slow. Um, it doesn't provide enough impetus for change. And again, I'll go back to the comparison of Italy and the United States to make this point. In the, in the uh, early to mid-1970s, both Italy and the United States uh, passed national laws on educating students with disabilities. And both of these laws favored regular class placement for students with disabilities. Even though in the American law, the word inclusion or inclusive education is not present anywhere in the law. But what happened was, um, at that time, the United States took a well, let me back up. At that time, both countries had a bunch of things in common. One was they had both had large systems of segregated classes and segregated schools for students with disabilities that had been developed post-World War II through the 1960s and into the early 1970s. So there were a lot of uh, large segregated schools and classrooms. Only about 20% of all students with disabilities in these uh, countries were included in regular class at that time when these national laws were passed. According to the Italians, uh, over a period of just a few years, they went from 20% in regular class to about 98% in regular class. The, um, it was a period in Italy that um, some called integrazione, no, uh, uh, integrazione salvaggio, which is a wild or savage inclusion. Basically, uh, a, this is a generalization, but basically what uh, the literature suggests is that they basically said next year we're closing all the special schools. All the special schools and special classes, no more. Everybody's going to be in regular class, figure it out. They didn't plan for it, they didn't prepare for it, they just said do it. Uh, with the notion of they were trying to create this equilibrium, with the notion that if you don't push people to do it, there's not any motivation to do it. Uh, there's no way to back out of it if we close these other programs. Whereas in the United States, we maintained a dual system. We kept all the special schools and special classes open, and then when a child would go into regular class, if things didn't work out right away, they could just send them away, send them to another place. Uh, too easy to do that. And so over the years, uh, the United States moved up only about one percentage point a year incrementally in including students with disabilities. So that now, 43 years later, we're only at about 64% of kids with disabilities in regular class. And again, uh, Italy's been at about 98% since sometime in the 1980s, in the late 1980s, uh, that they reached that point because they just went like this. And what they did was their, their system was described as very chaotic, and they kept passing incremental legislation, changing their personnel preparation for teachers, making changes to make things better. Um, Italy's not a utopia when it comes to including students with disabilities, but I think they offer us an example, and we have a lot to learn from their example. Um, uh, yeah, let's see about the end because some of the students have to go to class at two, so I'd like to run through this if I can. There's a lot here. Um, and we want to avoid a place that's based on disability labels or intensity of support need. So the idea that we're not going to say, well, this student has this type of disability, so they go to the autism program. Or this student has a physical disability, so they go to the physical disabilities program. And to understand that special education is a service, not a place. And we don't want to fall, this is one of those uh, ones that I used the other day, so for those of you who are in the other session, you've already seen this, but don't fall for the either-or approach. Some people will tell you, even special education experts, that um, it's all about instruction. And that if you want good instruction, we're going to have to segregate your, your child or your student. Um, and, other people, and, and those same people will say, we can include him, but he's not going to get good instruction. Uh, I would say that this is a false choice and that we, in order for us to grow and learn as teachers, 
we have to put ourselves in situations where we have to uh, face new challenges. We know how to pull kids out and teach them. We've known how to do that for decades. We all, and, but then the kids miss all the benefits of being included. We also know how to just dump kids in regular class and not well support them. That's not good either. So what we really need to focus on is how do we include students in a meaningful way and support them in a meaningful way so it's good for them and it's good for everybody else in the classroom. So part of this is changing our mindset about how we think about disability. And there are three main frames that I'm going to share with you, two of which I would argue are very unhelpful but are very common. And the third I would suggest to you is uh, one that is more amenable to supporting and including all students. One of the ones that's not so good is the medical model of disability. This is where people think of disability as abnormality, sickness, illness, something that needs to be fixed. Uh, the medical professions are the authority, um, and doctors predict things like, you know, she'll never walk, or, you know, she'll never do this, but she should put in an institution because she'll never contribute anything to your family. I mean, and this has happened in every country in the world. Okay, at one time or another, and it happens more or less in different countries still today. This model of thinking about disability is extremely harmful to people with disabilities and their families. Another uh, model that is very common and it's still very, very prevalent in the U.S. is a pity charity ment uh, mentality of disability. <clears throat> this is where we think, oh, isn't it so sad that this person has a disability? Uh, I don't know if you know who Jerry Lewis is, but he was a famous uh, American comedian, and he was famous in the United States for having a telephone where they would raise money for people with disabilities, and they would parade children with disabilities and say, oh, look at this poor child, please give money, you know. And um, the people in the disability community, they hated, when he was lying he died recently, they hated uh, Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis didn't understand this. It's like, I'm trying to help people with disabilities. Don't you understand? I'm trying to use my celebrity to help people. But what he didn't seem to get was that um, the pity charity mentality holds people down. It doesn't help lift people up. It's misguided benevolence. And um, unfortunately, we still have many professionals that operate from this perspective, and they might not even realize it. An alternative to these is the social model of disability. This is based on the idea that disability is not a personal failing. It's part of the range of what it means to be a human being. By the definitions that we think about disability, many people who we consider to be, quote, normal, will either temporarily have a disability at some time in their life, or as they age, they will develop disabilities, whether they're orthopedic disabilities, or dementia, or um, hearing loss, um, any number of things. And the premise around the social model is that people with impairments are disabled by, by a society's failure to accommodate their needs. And that people with impairments can and should take control of their own lives as much as possible. That they should have self-determination. Um, I gave an example the other day of uh, in, in having a conversation with folks about a, situ a, a historical situation in the United States that happened, I think it was in the 1700s. Um, on a place called Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard is an island, and uh, at the time, it was a very isolated place in New England. And because of its isolation, there was a very high level of hereditary deafness. And <clears throat> people think of deafness as a disability. It's on all, all the disability lists around the world. Well, a lot of people who are deaf don't think of it as a disability, interestingly. Um, but to be deaf in that context, that historical context, in that place and time, was not to be disabled. And the reason was very simple. Because, because the prevalence of deafness was so high, everyone that lived in that community spoke sign language. So it was not uh, a deficit that you were deaf because you could communicate. Because what's the, what's the disability? It's the, it's the environment fit with the person. And so there was a barrier, and the barrier was gone because everybody spoke the sign language. So, uh, again, we want to think about, um, here's Peter, student in a wheelchair, uh, pondering over a peril to where his next IEP meeting. Your attitude uh, might be my biggest barrier. I am, therefore I matter, and this kind of 
slogan on the right is kind of the uh, charge of the self-advocacy movement in the United States and Canada and probably other places around the world, which is nothing about me without me. So for the longest time, people with disabilities have not had a full voice in deciding how do services look, what supports are needed, what have been for me personally, making those decisions. We want to understand, we develop a shared understanding of inclusive education. So a, a parent is uh, saying to the principal, the school principal, we're trying to decide uh, which school district is best for our daughter. We want to know what you have, inclusion, full inclusion, inclusive education, or full inclusion? And the principal says, oh, I get it. It's a trick question. Mr. Booty continues to be followed by lack of clear definitions. And again, I've been talking with uh, some of you who are here now about the fact that if you talk to Americans about inclusive education, they think about disability almost exclusively. If you talk to Europeans about inclusive education, they think about it much broader uh, around issues of refugees, race, gender, um, sexual orientation, you name it, as wide as it goes. And, and I want to encourage you to think about it in that broader kind of world way than in the more narrow American way. Inclusive education, doing it wrong doesn't make it wrong. So one teacher is saying to the other, we placed Jason in a regular class part of the time, problem one. We assigned him a full-time aide or assistant, problem two. And we even did therapy in the back of the room, problem three. He still doesn't do the same work as the other kids. The inclusion isn't right for everyone. And this person is just shaking his head saying, you still don't get it. Doing it wrong doesn't make it wrong. So one of the things that we have to be constantly looking out for are mislabeled practices that are either partially implemented efforts um, and, or, and or low quality. So we haul, that's all. Sorry, support's not included in the cost of delivery. No dump. So we, we're not, inclusive education is not just dumping kids in regular class and saying, good luck. So some of the elements. And as, as I um, go through these elements, I ask you to think about uh, to what extent they occur in the schools that you're familiar with. And also, how they pertain to students with a full range of disability, because they might be true for some students, like students that have fairly mild disabilities, but they may not be true for students that have more intensive needs or have behavioral issues or whatever. So one is that all students are welcome. And that the first placement option is, that's considered for every child is the regular class in the school they would attend if they didn't have a disability. <laughs> and, um, and we're talking about all students, not just students with uh, with mild disability. So this is inclusion mishap number nine. The teacher's hiding behind the corner. And it's due to a faulty intercom speaker. Mrs. Smith thought the principal said, you have a new student coming to your classroom. He has disabilities. Do your best to elude him instead of include him. We also want to think of disability as a form of um, diversity. And that we don't just move this. Mike, a little bit, um, that we don't uh, deny access based on disability levels. Oh, that student has autism. They don't go to regular class. They go to the autism program. Uh, that's kind of the mentality. And also, to be thinking about um, disability from this international perspective of the UN's uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which I understand Egypt has signed on to. Is that right? So what we want to avoid is our reptilian responses to diversity. What do we do? What does what the hind brain of human beings do when, um, when they're confronted with things that they fear? Let's attack it. Let's eat it. Let's run away from it. And this is not helpful. And this is what we do way too often. And there's also the parole approach. You know, what are, we, what are you in for? Cerebral palsy. But they said with good behavior, I could be out in three to five. This is the parole approach to school inclusion. We put kids in a segregated environment, and then we ask them to earn their way out of the special environment. Um, that's, that's not, uh, not going to help. Appropriate supports are available. I don't know if you have the, 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 uh, the children's story in Goldilocks in Egypt or something like it about uh, 
When Goldilocks went to school, they gave her support services. The first set was too small, and it didn't fit, and the next set was too big, and it didn't fit, and the next set was just right, and fit just right. Support services that are only as special as necessary fit just right. So it's not about piling on all kinds of special services. It's trying to find the right match for the student that helps them have their education. Um, and students don't need to get, be sent to special environments like the clinical environment or the therapy school in order to get their supports. We want to be looking for more natural supports before we look at specialized supports. That what is typical is what's special. And what's special often is harmful. Um, even though it's meant to be helpful. And that's kind of the perversion of it, is we do things that we think are helping people, and they're helping them in one way, and they're hurting them in three other ways. So peer supports, teacher supports, regular people in the community support. Classes have proportional numbers of students with and without disabilities. Sometimes what we do in regular schools is we say, well, you know, we've got some kids who have some challenges, so let's put all the kids with learning disabilities and all the kids who are immigrants and all the kids who don't speak the language well, and let's group them all together, because then we can help them. And then what we've done is created an extremely difficult class to work with. So we want to have natural proportions. We want to have the same age options. So see the big kid there? This is placement problem number 32, functioning level rather than chronological age. The idea that we're going to, um, let's put the child in a class where it, he functions at a similar level. And then as the gap gets bigger and bigger, at some point people say, oh, well, inclusion doesn't work because now he's 12 years old or he's starting to maybe grow a beard and he's with little children because that's the level that he functions at. In good inclusive education, Students are in chronologically similar environments. Individually uh, appropriate learning outcomes with necessary supports are offered in shared educational experiences. So just, it's amazing how well you've adjusted your teaching. Now the students with severe disabilities are in your class. And the teacher says, well, I, I just keep reminding myself that my students were each different before inclusive education. That hasn't changed, just expanded. Because the idea that if you're a grade six teacher, that all of your children function in this narrow little grade six range, is not true. The grade six reading levels are this wide. If you're in a multi-age, wider, right? So the idea that it's children with disabilities that are creating heterogeneity in a school isn't true. Um, it, does it expand it? Does it extend it? Absolutely. But it doesn't create it. So if you're a good teacher, if you have an inclusive attitude and you're a good teacher, you can teach kids with disabilities. Might there be some new things that you need to learn that are specific to that child or that child's disability? Of course. But in terms of the base of what you know about how to interact with children, build relationships with children, how to use assessment to make decisions, how to use data to make decisions, what you know about curriculum, what you know about teaching, these things don't change because a child has a label, right? Uh, and inclusive education exists when the aforementioned elements are, occur on an ongoing daily basis. So the parents call in the school saying, we just moved to, your air, to the area and we have a daughter with a disability. Do you have inclusive education at your school? And the principal says, yes, every Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to 11, okay? Principal Jones fails to recognize the contradictions and contradiction in terms. You can't be included part-time. If you're only there part of the time, you are not included. And the kids don't think of, uh, the other kids in the class don't think of that student as included. So one of the things that has been a really um, important learning for me is that it's really, it's the adults, it's not, it's not the students. For every educationally segregated student, there are others who are virtually the same in terms of their attributes, disability characteristics, Etc., uh, who are being successfully included. Two students, virtually the same on learning characteristics and disability characteristics. One's in a special school, the other one's in a regular class. What could that be? It's not about their disability, it's about us. Our attitudes, our practices, the opportunities we provide. So um, I would argue that whether kids are included has less to do with them and more to do with us. So that one of the things that people want to 
um, do all the time is they want to use assessment to exclude people and to label them so that they can categorize them, so that they can sort them, so that they can separate them. Okay, and it's not about their disability, it's about us. And we can't allow our own apprehensions as teachers to restrict opportunities for our students. So just because we're uncomfortable with something, and some people are, might be uncomfortable with issues of race, or gender identity, or disability, or any form of diversity that you might care to talk about. But at the, at the top here, um, one teacher saying to the other, um, Aaron's doing so well in your class, Aaron's a student with a disability. Um, how is um, teaching a, how is event teaching a student with a disability? Well, the first day I saw an intimidated, scared girl. Then I realized I was looking in the mirror. And so the teacher was reflecting on her own uh, fears and apprehensions. We need to create opportunities for students to surprise us with what they're capable of. So often, one of the things that keeps students with disabilities down is low expectations. So, Yes, a tenant of good instruction is try to uh, establish a learning objective at the correct level of difficulty, not too easy, not frustrational, but kind of in this nice band of uh, based on assessment. But at the same time, you want to probe occasionally. Don't put a ceiling on this. So we want kids that will surprise us. And as I told some of you the other day, I think Down syndrome is one of the greatest examples of that it's not students with Down syndrome or other disabilities, it's us. Because when I started teaching, this was uh, when I was in college, it was the first, uh, the first journal that I ever got was in 1974, and this little cute garbage student with uh, Down syndrome. And back in the day, uh, they were referred to in the US as, quote, trainable. Trainable meant that they weren't, quote, educable meaning don't bother to try to teach them to read or write or do anything like that because they're not capable of that. Just teach them some basic life skills, some developmental skills, and then they'll spend their life in a sheltered workshop putting widgets together or maybe they'll stay home with their parents the rest of their life. Um, and now in 2004, I'm going to show you, uh, and do you have the, the, um, the text that was uh, the paper? Yeah, because I'm not sure how well you're going to hear this. I'm going to share a graduation speech by Aaron McKenzie. Um, Aaron McKenzie is a young woman uh, with Down syndrome who graduated from high school in 2004. And she's giving a speech in front of over a thousand people that she helped compose with the help of her mother. But you'll see by her behavior, she's reading, you know, she's composed these ideas. It's the things that she's talking about that are quite amazing. So I'm going to switch over to. We've got it set up here, and it's just three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hugh. I think we had a new teacher. It's a very hard work to bring, bring with him. And that at the least and funny in the middle. We know two things in our group. And we discovered uh, what we were good at or like to do. Okay. I think that a lot of Shakespeare. And think of a coin and throw a club. And looking good stuff. I thought I would spend a moment and read about giving culture and me. I don't know. It got diamonds. Sometimes we need help from other men or dogs. And Sometimes we need a bit of them. It is night of other people. We learn that something odd for us. 
had to stay back and we had to be on time and be on the way. But we have more to know the character who is the and one of my very great love attack. I want you to do a thing about but not down before for him a bad or bad or bad. But I want much more than keep it out. Much more, much more, much more. Do it and do it Assumption holds uh, that there's less danger to students. 
students if teachers assume instructional failure is due to instructional inadequacy rather than student deficits. So in other words, we're not going to blame students because they have a disability. Oh, they're not learning because they have this disability. No, they're not learning because we haven't figured out the right instructional approach with them yet. So we have to take data and keep trying and find new ways to do this. And this quality access is based on inclusive environments, these pillars. Inclusive environments, meaningful curriculum, effective instruction, and necessary supports. And we want to be aware of the traps. And the traps are, these are little mouse traps. I'm not going to mouse traps the same way here. Or if you have mice here, I don't know. But um, teacher is the host only. Everything's special. Paraprofessionals are really in charge. Uh, these are some of the traps. So we, we want to look at what are the appropriate roles and in interactions with teachers, special educators. Paraprofessionals are like teaching assistants and related services, which would be like physiotherapists, speech pathologists, etc. One of the traps is the trap of hosting. So I don't feel prepared to teach students with disabilities, the teacher says to the principal. Despite having a master's degree and 18 years of experience, Mrs. Snippet tries to convince Mr. Moody that students with disabilities in her class would be better served by an assistant with no experience. Doesn't make any sense, but it happens all the time in the US. We've got a study um, that we did back in 2001 that showed that while there's, there were a small number of teachers who were very engaged with their students with disabilities, when we looked at student, uh, teachers who were less engaged or disengaged, there was a small percent who said, I don't want to work with students with disabilities. That's, that, that's not what I signed up for. If I wanted to be a special ed teacher, I would have gone to school for special ed. I went to, I went to school to teach science. And they don't even say you teach student science, they say you teach science. And uh, hopefully there aren't too many of those still around, but there are a few. There's a lot of people who are less engaged as teachers because they, they don't think they're supposed to. Because we send students into class with an assistant attached to the hip. And, and we say, the teacher says, well, um, they have their own person. I don't need to worry about them. Or then they say also, I don't know how. How do I work with this child? So what we often see is this island in the mainstream. Students physically in the regular class, but it's a micro-exclusion. They're separated within the class. Island in the mainstream. Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Cooper are still trying to figure out why Fred doesn't feel like part of the class. Another quasi, uh, another trap is quasi-teamwork. Look over there, a well-functioning team. Isn't it beautiful? Herb and Sally add the elusive collaborative team to their life list of rare and endangered species. So collaborative teamwork is really important, but a lot of times, just like inclusion, it's mislabeled. If you ask Americans whether they uh, engage in teamwork, they will all say yes. But the reality is that they're not actually engaged in collaborative teamwork. We also want to have collaboration and creative problem solving. This is the anatomy of an effective team member. Uh, you know, people don't have to be experts in order to be good collaborators and engage in creative problem solving. But we are looking for people who are willing learners, who have great ideas, maybe can maintain a sense of optimism and humor about their work. These are the kinds of things that, these are the people that people want to work with. There's the pro problem of um, just dropping special approaches into the regular class. That also doesn't work. What we need is to look at the context of the regular classroom. And this is assuming that the regular classroom is a good place. Okay? So you may have some, just like we do, you may have some regular classrooms that are good places, and you may have some other regular classrooms that are not such good places. And so somebody might say, well, gosh, I have a classroom at public school in, in Cairo, and there are 70 students in my room, and I'm frantic. And they say, and now you want me to include a student with a disability. And this goes to this issue of it, these, these ideas won't overcome that problem. Okay? So some of those regular education problems have to be dealt with first. Partial participation rather than all or nothing. There's this mentality of, you can, if you can do all of it, you're welcome. And if you can't do all of it, then we're not going to let you do any of it. That's just a wrong thinking. Imagine if that was true for anything in our own lives. You know, um, 
It just doesn't work. This is one of the things I said I promised I'd share with you today from the other day, and it's a conceptualization of how to think about including students with disabilities in regular classes who have different learning outcomes. So lots of times one of the mistakes we make is to say, well, if you're going to be in regular class, you've got to do regular work at the same level as all the other kids. Well, if that's true, then all students with intellectual disability will never be included. Um, and what this does is gives you a way to think about, uh, in the middle, all the students have the same curriculum, different, they have the same content level and amount, and what a lot of you are familiar with around differentiated instruction would fall in that middle category, because kids still have the same learning outcomes. But if we just look below grade level, and I'm going to give you some examples on the next pages, um, next slides, multi-level same refers to you've got a heterogeneous group of students, they're in a regular class activity with their classmates, they have learning outcomes uh, that are in the same curriculum area and the same content, but at a different level. You could also go further away from the norm with multi-level different. In this case, still the same curriculum area, like math or science. All the kids are in the same shared activity. Might be a small group activity, might be a large group activity. But they're doing something completely, not completely different, but they're doing something different. And I'm going to show you again an example. And curriculum overlapping is the smallest uh, option, rarest option, and that's where a student is in a regular class, shared activity with their classmates, but let's say it's a science activity, but their primary learning outcomes are not science. Their primary learning outcomes might be communication, social skills, literacy, within a science activity. And that's why it's called curriculum overlapping, because you're overlapping two or more curriculum areas within the same shared activity. So for example, um, if these, are the, these are the elements. Teaching a, diverse group, teaching a diverse group of learners, so heterogeneous characteristics of students. You've got a shared activity. They're playing an educational game together. They're building work, making a mural together. They're doing a science lab experiment together. Could be a small group, a medium-sized group, a large group. Uh, each learner has individually appropriate learning outcomes at an appropriate level for that student. So the advanced student could have a high goal. Most of the kids could have learning outcomes in the middle. Another student might have a, a, a lower goal. All the learning outcomes are within the same curriculum area, like science. So same subject matter refers to the same topical subject matter. So for example, World War II uh, students uh, learns major events and historical figures, others explain the political economic factors leading to the war. Um, in math, for a different subject matter, most students are learning fractions, another student is learning geometric shapes or counting. Let's say you've got a board game and the students are picking cards, each might have a different stack of cards. So they all get the shared game together, but when it's my turn, I have to answer a question about fractions. When it's your turn, you have to answer a question about of geometric shapes, okay? Curriculum overlapping has all the same characteristics except the last one, which is learning outcomes coming from two or more curriculum areas. And a student is pursuing communication and social goals within a science lab where most students are assembling a model of the human heart and are learning anatomy and physiology. Hand me the red piece. Hand me you know, or we're going to take turns doing different things like this. So uh, this overlaps communication, social, and science. Use of assistance. This is what can happen uh, when paraprofessionals buy students. I know you have to go to class. Sorry. Um, so don't build inclusive education on the backs of paraprofessionals. This is, again, one of the mistakes that we've made that I hope that you don't make. So when people say, okay, we're going to include these kids, we've got to support them by putting a shadow on their, on their side, it does not work. We're trying to undo that now in the state. So just don't go there to start with, and then you won't have to undo it. Uh, if they're used wisely, they can be very helpful. So great assistance used wisely can be worth their weight in gold. But the problem is they're not usually used wisely. This is um, what the literature tells us is wise use. 
that their instruction should be supplemental, not exclusive or primary, that they should be working from professionally prepared plans, that they should be trained uh, to implement what we're asking them to do. We need to teach them how to respond to behaviors. They should get ongoing supervision and monitoring. The problem is that these are rare. Very logical, very simple, but we don't do it. At least at home, we don't do it. This is one of the problems that happens when we have a professional to always attach to have what I think people here call a shadow assistant. Joey noticed a mysterious force field around his assistant that children could not break through. It creates a physical and a symbolic barrier to others becoming involved. And this is a list of examples of detri inadvertent detrimental effects associated with excessive use and proximity of paraprofessionals. It separates kids from classmates, kids become unnecessarily dependent, interferes with peer interactions, with teacher engagement, it can be stigmatizing, limited access to highly qualified teachers, etc. You see the list. There was a tremendous uh, study in the UK led by Peter Blanchford and uh, Anthony Russell and uh, um, oh gosh, Rob Webster, excuse me. And what was really interesting is that the UK uh, hired just thousands of uh, teaching assistants. And the, the government, instead of doing the study first to find out if it would be effective, they hired a whole bunch of people and then said, is it effective? And they collected longitudinal data, this is a multi-million dollar, multi-year study, huge out of the Institute on Education at the University of London. And some of the core data that they collected were their traditional test scores. Uh, just because with and without disabilities, we're getting paraprofessional supports or assistant supports across seven grades and three subjects, the three that they do their main testing in, which are uh, English, maths, and science. I gotta practice saying maths, because we don't say maths in the US, we say math. Uh, but you say maths here, don't you? Or do you? No? The, the Brits do. The Brits do. So we'll, for, for that, I mean, it was in Wales as well. It was England and Wales, which is the dragon there. So what was really interesting was there were seven grades going from early grades to middle grades, and then there were um, three subjects. So there were 21 relationships that they looked at. And what they thought going in, this is me talking to the researchers, they didn't think they would see any difference because they thought that these tests were not designed to measure what they were really looking for and that it was very gross indices and they expected to see really no difference. That's what they expected. What really shocked them was that there were no positive correlations and there were, that 16 of the 21 relationships were negative. So, meaning that students who had paraprofessional support did worse than those who had similar characteristics who did not have paraprofessional support. And this seemed counterintuitive to them because, well, these kids are getting more help. Should they be doing better? We're giving them more help. Does this make sense to us? They did a sub-study where they put microphones on teachers and assistants, the shadow assistants that were helping these kids. And, um, and then they analyzed the interactions with students between teacher to student and shadow to student. And what they found was, in general, that teachers engaged, trained, qualified teachers engaged in a whole bunch of good teaching behaviors with these students. The, the assistants, the shadow assistants, they um, might have been very nice people, very hard working, but they gave incorrect information, they didn't know how to provide appropriate uh, scaffolding of the work. They didn't know how to draw students' previous work into what they were doing. They didn't help them think conceptually about, in this case, it was math. So it was about getting the right answer. It was about getting it done fast. And sometimes it wasn't. So it was a lot of bad teaching. So they, they found that there is a difference in the quality of instruction coming from somebody who's actually a highly qualified teacher versus a shadow assistant. And, uh, and the, the assistants do the work for the kids. Let me help you with that. What do I get in turn? 
after only two months as a teacher assistant class finds that her spelling has improved, her math skills are home, and she's discovered she has artistic abilities. I had a parent say to me, you know how the parents, uh, children bring things home and they put them on the refrigerator? The parents put them on the refrigerator? And this parent of a child with a pretty significant disability at the holiday, they did some holiday artwork, and she looked at me and she said, my, my child did not do this, right? The assistant did it. So what we want to do is we want to give our assistants just a little bit of training and then treat them like their teachers. This is a mistake. Uh, after such a brief training, am I really ready? No worries, you just completed our basic paraprofessional or assistant training. You're good to go. Be aware of the training trap. You could be eaten alive. So we're just feeding them, uh, in this case, the, the Nile crocodile here. That's the training trap. And is there a double standard? And the question I want to encourage you to ask, that I always encourage people to ask, is whatever the practice is, would that practice be okay if the student did not have a disability? So in our case at home, it's like an assistant providing, a shadow assistant providing 75 to 100 percent of the daily instruction to a student. Would that be acceptable if the student didn't have a disability? It wouldn't be in the U.S. Uh, the student knows more, excuse me, the assistant knows more about the student's educational performance than the teacher or special educator. Would that be acceptable? It wouldn't be at home. A student is assigned an assistant, unskilled in algebra, and uncomfortable with the subject to be the student's tutor. Does that make any sense? But will we do that for kids without disabilities? No, they get a math specialist. And ineffective supports. If we remodel bathrooms the way we delivered support services using a specialist reliant model, this is where we're going to say, oh, the student has lots of different disabilities, so we're going to have an OT, a PT, and a speech pathologist, and a vision specialist, and a hearing specialist, and an orientation and mobility specialist, and they're all mixed up. And we end up with this. Fred expresses concern after team members agree to all pull in different directions. Not sure this is working for me. But what people do is they staple separate parts together. Magic, it's now a team IUD. Of course it's not. So being present, being part of the classroom community being, means being present. Sometimes parents and others advocate for all kinds of special services, and then the student's not in class. So you see all the special things in the schedule. Jason's mother has a close encounter with the old saying, the only thing worse than not getting what you want is getting what you want. The cutting edge of advocacy has shifted away from pull-out services, one-to-one -one shadow assistance, focus on special, toward in-class support, teachers being engaged, co-teaching, peer supports, universal design, embedding specialization within the regular class in the most natural ways. And when changes are made to facilitate the inclusion of students with the most complex challenges, it typically results in educational improvement for a much wider group of students. So we end up with following fierce figuring and formulating Fern finds the common denominator of quality education, and that is that students' lives will be better because they went to our school. And that's really what we're looking for, right? If they go to our school and their life isn't better because they went to our school, what's the point? So thank you very much. I know we're at, well, over time. It was just about an hour since we started a couple minutes late. We're right on an hour, but uh, I know that was a lot in a short time. Uh, I know some people had to leave. I'm happy to hang around for a while, either to um, answer questions or, or chat with people. And um, so thank you very much. Yes? Um, what's the next? Fixed percentage, because it's bound by context. So in Italy, where they define different disability differently, the natural proportion would be probably not to have more than 5%, probably not more than one child with a disability is going to be in a class. But remember, a class, a disability there is only going to be students with the more intensive disabilities. So they're going to maybe have one student that has a significant intellectual disability and others that might have learning, what we call learning disabilities, but they're not going to count them. So that in their case, their natural proportion might be 5%. Ours might be 15% because of how we define disability, but it's really going to look about the same. 
which is probably going to be, uh, based on the slide I showed you the other day, at least in the states, we find that in general, about, uh, about 25 to 28% of students have some kind of special need, meaning not necessarily have a disability, but they either have a disability or they have some other, uh, something else that puts them at risk for school failure. Maybe they're coming from intense poverty. Um, maybe they're coming from a very difficult uh, home situation that's affecting their mental health. Uh, they're at risk. Um, so I think in general, in a lot of uh, Western countries anyway, you know, ballpark 25% is, is, but it might be different here. And so natural proportion is always going to be context bound. Uh, the study that was conducted in the UK. Yeah. So based on this study, we can we just come to a decision uh, in which we will need to specify the responsibilities and duties of teaching assistants oh, uh, by detaching them completely from instruction, or can we still be in the middle and be saying that well, from time to time they will be uh, giving some instructions if they know how to do it? Oh yeah, because we are. I, I see that we are on the verge of uh, making a decision based on the responsibilities of this teaching So definitely, um, definitely we want to clarify the roles and we want to make sure that their roles match their skills. So we don't want to say, well, they have a role in instruction, but they're not trained in instruction. Mm -hmm. So, and um, there's two documents that uh, I can send to Soha because uh, uh, I, I can get your email. But there's a roles document um, that I can share. <laughs> and there's also a document called the Paraprofessional Conundrum, which talks about the problems of, you know, if you use it for instruction, you don't. So for example, in Italy, they don't use nearly as many assistants as we do, even though they're more inclusive than we are. They don't use assistants very much at all. And where they do use assistants, it is not for instruction. What's interesting in the UK is they're continuing to try to um, use uh, assistance for instruction. They're trying to provide better training. But the UK is very labor oriented, okay, in terms of teacher unions. And so if you look back at the historical information about teacher unions in uh, the UK, they'll say things like, oh, it would be scandalous to hire an assistant who's not a teacher to do the work of a trained teacher, okay? That's very much a labor mentality, right? A union labor mentality. Um, what's interesting in the United States, where most teachers are unionized, is instead of saying um, that work should go to the highest qualified, highest paid uh, individual, which would be a labor approach, from just from a pure labor economics standpoint, that they say, well, we don't really want that work. You know, it's fine. Let the paraprofessionals do that. We don't want that work. Um, that would be like a plumber saying, well, we don't want to unclog toilets, you know. Uh, you know, if your toilet gets plugged in the United States, you call a, a union plumber and they come and unplug your toilet and they get a lot of money for it. They don't say, well, I don't want to do that. That's a dirty job. I'm going to give it to some, let somebody else do it, right? So it's very interesting. So I think that there, there is a potentially a role for paraprofessionals in instruction. But it's a very slippery slope, very slippery. And it raises a lot of equity issues because often children who are economically disadvantaged and or children who have disabilities are the ones that are getting support from the assistants, not the teachers or not the specialists. So um, I don't think it's an all or nothing thing, but I can tell you that the United States has gone on one end uh, very ineffectively. Um, and we're trying to pull back from that in many places right now. Yes. Um, well, first I'd like to thank you for that lecture very much. It had a lot of practical and do's and don'ts for educators in general, and I feel like sometimes that's not very common in you know large lectures that are targeted at diverse audiences. So thank you for that. But it also I think addresses the larger problem that inclusive education and training educators to be inclusive that way is not really inclu included in a lot of curricula for teacher training and teacher certification and I feel like that is really important that you um, talked about that. Yeah, so this is a really important uh, uh, 
this is a really important issue in terms of looking at teacher preparation. And we're, we're continuing to do that in the states as far as our regular education teachers. So most places in the U.S. now, regular, edu regular education teachers have to have a little bit in special ed. And, uh, but I can tell you, for example, at our university, they have a course that they have to take. And then when they do their internship, their student teaching, their supervised student teaching, they have to develop their lessons in a way to show that they're accommodating, including, or universally designing for, or differentiating for students with disabilities. They have to demonstrate competencies because the reality is there will be children with disabilities in their classrooms. Our, we developed at the university about 15, 20 years ago a minor in special education. And it is one of the most popular minors in the university. We have about 200, our, our university, we have uh, about 10,000 undergraduate students, and I think we have about 500 education students in the university. And of those, over 200 are in the minor. Okay, so they're taking like five courses in disability. And some of them are getting dual certified. This is the other big movement around the United States is to have inclusive higher education programs so that all teachers are trained in both, prepared in both general and special education. So it's not like, well, that's not my job. I wasn't trained for that. It's your job. You do that. I understand. But that's very good, very insightful. Um, I do have a couple of questions. I'll ask one and maybe at the end if there's time I can ask the other one. Um, when you talk about making them, uh, putting them in classes that are chronologically age um, appropriate instead of functionality appropriate, um, wouldn't that make it too challenging for them in case like they don't really get the content? Um, wouldn't that you know make them in terms of understanding and keeping up? Yeah, it would if the teacher just taught badly. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's so this is the problem. People say, well, you want to put a child who's functioning here in a class that's functioning here, it'll be the exact same, the exact problem you just you just mentioned, right? And, um, and it's like, well, um, they say, well, the teacher just lectures and gives quick tests and um, it'll be over the student's head. And I, I would say, yeah, that sounds terrible. I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't put a student, I wouldn't want to put a student with a disability in that situation. But then you have to ask the question, is that good education in general ed? And it's not consistent with good teaching in general ed. So what we're seeing is that the cutting edge of, of quality instruction in regular ed, which is activity-based, project-based, inquiry-based, creative problem-solving, group work, um, all these kinds of uh, approaches, design thinking, uh, are consistent with students having learning outcomes like the multi-level and curriculum overlapping at different levels. So the idea that the student has to keep up, that they have to function at the same level, some students with disabilities can do that because remember, disability is very wide, right? So if you have somebody who has a visual impairment but is not intellectually disabled at all, so they can yeah, they have access and they, we have people who are brilliant, who are deaf or blind or have a physical disability only, no problem. Most people with um, specific learning disabilities Oh, can do great, great. I mean, really what we're talking about is a very small percentage of students that have either multiple disabilities, severe autism in conjunction with intellectual disability, multiple disabilities. Um, and one of the things that we talked about with some of you the other day is a, a, an, initi an initiative that is happening in the U.S. called Think College. It's where students with developmental disabilities are included in regular college classes. And they don't function at the same level as their peers, but they have peer mentors, college students who are their peer mentors. And, um, and they're in regular college classes on our campus, taking geography and dance and history and foreign language and literature and getting a lot out of it and having a great uh, experience, learning a ton of functional life skills by navigating the campus, uh, by their social interactions, their doing things with their classmates. Um, I encourage you to look online at thinkcollege.net, which is the national umbrella organization out of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, uh, and, and the, or to look at ours at um, Think College Vermont. And 
and um, you'll, you'll see uh, some information about the program. But again, it's evidence that it's not about the characteristics of the student. If we say, well, we teach one way, and in order for you to be a student in my class, you must adapt to how I teach. That's not what a teacher does. That's what somebody who just spews information does, right? If somebody's really being a teacher in a classroom on a day-to-day -day basis with students, they have to adjust their teaching to reach their student. That's what good teachers do. So it's up to teachers to change. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to add to her question. Now, if that, what you're saying is if a child is intellectually below the level of the class, the teacher has to prepare special, special, uh, um, special curriculum for them. So or first, they have access to the general curriculum, but the, the teacher and the special educator would work together to say, this, they would start with what's happening in the regular. So, for example, um, if, if they're working on um, something in biology, mm -hmm. well, let's say it was the, the, we were talking about in high school with the um, cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. They might, the student might be working on, like, what's the heart and what does the heart do? The heart pumps blood through your body, right? Mm -hmm. So it might be something very basic like that. What is, what are, where are the lungs? What are the lungs do? Can you identify the lungs? What are the lungs for? The lungs are for breathing. You know, as opposed to another student might be um, looking at much more, um, much smaller substructures of the heart, you know, um, the aorta, the valves, and, and um, they might be looking at, um, you know, might, they might even be looking at something at the cellular level if they're really advanced. So they're looking at things at different levels, but the, but the idea is that you try to figure out what's the essential thing that you want this person to know about this. They don't have to know everything, but again, it's this idea that I mentioned before is, some people say, well, if they can't do all of it, we're not gonna let them do any of it. As opposed to partial participation is one of the foundations of inclusive education. Let's give you access to as much as you can. Let's let, let you surprise us with what you might be capable of. Let's support you and try to figure out how much of this can you get. And that's where we've gotten, like the example of students with Down syndrome, that's where we've gone from virtually nothing in regular ed to Aaron understanding and loving Shakespeare, right? Um, and for another kid, it's astronomy. For another kid, it's science. For another kid, it's math, whatever it is. But if it's a completely new, um, new subject for the child, how can the teacher explain for regular children, for the, for the mainstream children, and for the child with disability at the same time, for a, new, a whole new subject for both of them? That's what I, that's what, that is my question. Without the aid of a, you know, a special educator or, or um, assistant in the classroom, that's what I mean. You know, it's really interesting. So, the, so again, the special educators and the teachers are working together. In the same class? Yeah, but not always at the same time, because I mean, the special educator isn't assigned full time in one classroom. They're in that classroom, and they might be in three other classrooms. Okay, so they're only there part of the time. But think about um, when you're doing something at home with a family, and you've got um, extended family and kids of a certain age, and they they know exactly what to do. And now there's a young one, and it's new to them. Do you need like a special, I mean, do you know how to, people know how to do this. People know how to explain something different to somebody who's at a different level. They know how to make accommodations. I gave the example the other day about recreation of somebody, of people playing volleyball in their backyard at a, at a picnic, and, um, and, and a little one wants to join. You don't say, well, you can't play as well as we can, so you're not allowed on the court. You say, no, oh, come on, join us. And then when it's their turn to serve, you don't make them stand at the back baseline and serve the ball because you know that they're not big enough to get the ball over the net. So what do you do? You have them come forward to the, to the front. And uh, it's like, people, people think that this is so, like, there's some kind of secret thing. We know how to do this. And families are one of our best examples. So for example, if you've got a student with a disability um, and you're presenting something new, one of the really structural, simple things that I would change is you almost always see the student in the back of the room or on the fringe with the shadow next to them. If I were the teacher, 
I put that student among, near, near the front in the group where, and I might engage them in, like if I'm a primary teacher and I'm showing the students a book, I might have them stand next and say, I need you to turn the page for us. And can you point to this thing? And so like, you might be working on a different content or vocabulary for, um, they might be working on literature vocabulary for the uh, students without disabilities. This student might be learning how to identify, um, you know, different things that are picture-based. And it might be, okay, you know, can you point to the horse in this picture? Point to, you know, this, you know, and they're incorporating it in, in there. It's, it's, it's not, it, you know, there's another thing that I sent to one of the groups that I can resend to you. It's about um, that including students is simple but not easy. Uh, the ideas are actually very simple. And again, people who are good natural teachers can do these things without a lot of specialization. And I think that's part of what we want to get across to people is you know how to teach. You know how to include younger children. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a grandfather. You know, my, my grandfather, uh, scarily, just turned 13, uh, 14 this year. Um, but when she was little and, and we were going to make cookies, you know, with grandma and grandpa, you know, we didn't say, well, I'm sorry, sweetie, you can't make cookies because, you know, you can't even reach the counter. What do you do? You get a stool or a chair and you put it there and it's like, well, they can't, she can't really break the eggs yet at, at, at four years old very effectively. So what do you do? We break the eggs and put them in a dish and now you take the dish and pour it in. And can, you, can she stir it all so that it all mixes beautifully? No. But can we do some of it hand over hand? Can she do some of it on her own? You know, I mean, people know how to do this stuff. And, and part of it is reminding people that, you know, it, it doesn't have to be super complicated, that it can be fairly simple. And also, it doesn't have to be perfect at the, the beginning. That if you set people on a good path, like if you set a teacher on a good path, um, they will go further than you can imagine. I find that regular ed teachers go further often than special ed teachers, and we don't try to prescribe to them everything and how you're going to do it, uh, or even what you're going to do, but we try to give them starting points and a direction. If I, I find that if I give a regular ed teacher who's new to this more than a starting point and a direction, they shut down on me, uh, because they feel too pressed on. But if I just say, let's, let's figure out what, what's a good starting point in terms of what should, what should be the content that we're focusing on in this new lesson. Like, what's the learning for the student in this lesson? And, you know, how are we going to set this up and let them loose? They're amazing. They're amazing. If they're not good teachers, you know, it's not going to be a pretty picture, right? But if they're a good teacher to begin with, they, they can do it. I've seen it over and over again. Just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, sorry. About the assessment of uh, students with disabilities, uh, we know that these students need to go through the same assessment procedures, right? Uh, there's a formal assessment that is compulsory for almost all students, and we are differentiating the instructions for uh, the students. But that, that, uh, does that mean that we should also differentiate the assessment? and we should follow different procedures for the students. So I want to just clarify the two different types of big assessment that we're talking about. So I don't think you're talking about assessment for determination of eligibility. No, no, summative. You're talking about summative Assessment. evaluation like the big standardized test that the students take. So the way that it works in the US, and it's, it's working partially, is 98% of the students the top functioning 98% are required to take the regular test. Now, they could have an accommodation in terms of time or, or assistive technology or something like that. 2% um, are eligible for what's called alternate assessment. And every state is required to have an alternate assessment for students uh, who have the most severe disabilities. Uh, there's something called dynamic learning maps which is used by some of the states. Other states are using other approaches. Uh, where, I say it's partially working because there's a group that is just above the 2% and up to maybe about, and I'm just guessing here, you know, maybe up to 
20% or so, that is a very gray area where people feel like the test is uh, potentially harmful to the student, that it's too frustrational, that it doesn't make sense. And, it, and these tests um, are very gross in terms of, for, for a student at the lower end of the spectrum, it doesn't provide a tremendous amount of helpful in, uh, information for, for teaching. For the kids at the upper end, it can provide some helpful information, but at the lower end, the low, it's at lower 25%, I'm not sure that it provides a lot. But this uh, tests that you're talking about are uh, like high stakes uh, standardized tests or standardized. more alternative tests in class? No, no, like, these are the ones I'm referring to, I thought you were asking about are the, are the uh, standardized tests. They're not necessarily high stakes. Whether they're high stakes varies from state to state. So in some states, if you don't pass the test, you don't graduate. Uh, what's been interesting is when states put in high stakes, must pass to graduate, they started lowering the level that you needed to pass because <laughs> students were passing the test. So it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of politics involved. And this is one of the biggest problems, and I'm sure it's a problem in every country, is politicians are driving a great deal of education policy, and they don't necessarily know much about education. So. Uh, so, so how about uh, the tests in class, like the evaluations that are going on at the end of each course? Uh, yeah. are, are they generally being equally tested or assessed or evaluated? Yes, yeah. If students in a regular class, they're being, they're being, and usually the assessment is more ongoing than that. I mean, they're doing some daily assessments and weekly assessments. They're doing all kinds of ongoing assessment. Okay. I have a quick question. Uh, do you still have resource rooms in the United States of America in order for students to send take one-to-one -one sessions yeah. when needed? Yeah. So um, there's a, there's what in the U.S. is referred to as a continuum of placements, okay. going from homebound, hospital, special school, special class, resource room, regular class with supports. So there's the full range of possibilities. It's just that um, what type of um, system you're in depends on where you live. Mm -hmm. And if you live in one state, you're included a lot. If you're in another state, you're in a resource room a lot. If you're in another state, you're in a special class a lot. So the variation across the country is very wide. Mm -hmm. And then even if um, a student is considered to be included, so typically when people talk about regular class placement, the federal definition is that they have to be in regular class 80% of the time or more. That's the highest category. So uh, that's, we have a category of 80 to 100%, 40 to 80%, below 40%. Okay, according to the need of the student. According to the need of the student. But again, the need of the student is based on the adults. On the teacher, of course. The adults. Of course. Yeah, not just the teacher, it's a team. The team, yes. Yeah. Uh, last lecture, you, you said that uh, in, spite of, in spite of the fact that, despite the fact that some students needed one-to-one, uh, -one, it was better for them, it was better for other students who were totally, fully included, they got better results than those who were, uh, who were pulled out. Last lecture, you said something about fully included kids got better results or better um, no, but full uh, inclusion. He was, he was yeah, full inclusion. to pull out. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly um, which point you're thinking of, but basically the, the the research, you know, the research generally says, and it's always different for individual kids, right? But in general, the research says that students. Who, who have students with disabilities who have more time in regular class do better. Yeah. In general, but it differ better. it differs from one disability to the other and the from severity. One, one. It differ it differs from one uh, disability to the other and the severity of the case. Because for example, a severe case of autism, I believe he would be, he or she would benefit more uh, on one to one basis. However, I, he has to be also included in the classroom at some part of the day. 
in order to learn the social skills from uh, taking turns, raising hands when he wants to say something and express himself. Well, it's interesting because uh, in some of the research that we've done, uh, we've had a small number of schools that have completely moved away from the one-to-one -one model. Yes. Completely. No one-to-ones. Very small number of schools. Hmm. And what was interesting was that people were, would say, oh my goodness, the sky is going to fall in. It's going to be terrible. Hmm. Awful things are going to happen. And not only did nothing bad happen, good things happened. Okay. So, I mean, we make these assumptions like students ought to, you know, I've written an article, again, I can send you some of these things that I'm going to send them through so long, mostly, uh, is that uh, there's an assumption that, well, if you're talking about moving away from one-to-one -one students, well, you're not talking about kids with autism, right? I mean, they have to have one-to-ones, right? Or kids with Down syndrome, they, they have to have one-to-one -one in a regular class, right? And uh, we're trying to challenge that because there are examples of students with very significant autism, or whether it's Down syndrome or anything else. schools have to be ready. Schools have to be ready. The, Teach the teachers, teachers have to be well trained. Well, this is the other thing is, so this is the Italian versus the American example. Okay. The Italians basically said, we can't wait for you. This is an excuse. We can't wait for you. People say, oh, we're not trained. We're not ready. We've got to get ready. It's going to take so much time to get ready. And, um, and so they said, it'll never happen if we do it that way. Because that's what the Americans done, 1% a year. That's what we've done, 1% a year. We're still not there. The Italians basically said, we're not going to wait for you to get ready. Here they are. Let's figure it out together. Yeah. OK? We're smart people. We can figure this out. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you so much.